Welcome to the exam review of the UK Actuarial Profession CT6 exam paper for April 2016. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, I'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. If you'd like more detailed solutions, then refer to our asset, ASET, which stands for ACTED Solutions with Exam Technique, which give both model and alternative solutions as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from our eStore in time for students' preparation for the September 2016 exams. This is the second paper from our new CT6 Chief Examiner, and looking at these two papers, we can see that already he has a preference for proofs and bookwork. And you'll see that as we go through this paper. Question 1 tests loss distributions from Chapter 3 of the Notes. We have to find the median of a Pareto distribution. Well, this will be no problem. All we have to do is use the fact that the CDF of the median will be halfway through the distribution. And we can use the CDF formula for the Pareto from page 14 of the tables. In part two, we have to comment on the skewness of the Pareto. You may be tempted to use the formula for the coefficient of skewness from page 14 of the tables, but this is only valid for alpha is more than three, whereas we have alpha is equal to two. So what do we do? Well, part two follows on from part one. We could find the median, and then using the results in the tables, also find the mean. And then we recall from CT3 that when the mean is greater than the median, this means that it's positively skewed. At worst, given that all loss distributions in chapter three are positively skewed, you could have guessed and at least scored some marks. Question two tells us about two types of claims which are exponentially distributed with different means and we wish to calculate the mean and variance of the loss amount for a randomly chosen claim. This kind of question has been asked a number of times before, and is almost identical to October 2011 question 7. The mean is easy to get. You'd naturally say it's 25% of the first mean and 75% of the second. However, this rule does not work for the variance, even if you put squared on the constants. The reason for that is we're not actually adding two random variables together, but choosing a value randomly from them. What we're actually given are conditional distributions. Given the information in the question, we can calculate the conditional mean and variance, i.e. the means and variance, depending on which type of claim we have. We then use the formulae from page 16 of the tables. Though to be honest, it will be easier to calculate the variance by working out e of x squared and then taking away the mean squared. Part two, we have to explain whether this is a good approximation. And again, students should remember that part two follows on after part one. We've been calculating the new mean and variance. What we could do is compare that to the mean and variance of an exponential. The most obvious thing about those is that the variance is the square of the mean. Question three asks us to calculate a posterior probability given prior probabilities and some sample data. So clearly we're testing posterior distributions from chapter two of the notes. Usually we do this by using the fact that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. However, in this case, we have a discrete prior. And so the proportional formula doesn't work well. Well, what do we have to do? Well, we go back to Bayes' theorem. We want to calculate the new improved probability that P is equal to a sixth, given our sample data, which is that we had four correct predictions. Using Bayes' formula from page five of the tables, this will equal probability x is four given that p is the sixth, multiplied by the probability that p is six, divided by our denominator. This type of question has come up a number of times before, most recently April 2010 and October 2011. And this question is almost identical to the April 2010 question one. Question four tests simulation from chapter 14 of the notes, Parts one and two involve the inverse transform method, and part three involves the acceptance rejection method. In parts one and two, we're gonna be using the inverse transform method to simulate values from discrete random variables. To do that, we'll have to calculate their CDF, and then we generate a random number from a uniform zero one, and if it's between zero and the first CDF value of a third, we'll return the value one, and so on. So this should have been some easy marks especially since this was recently tested in September 2014 and September 2013. Part three involves acceptance rejection, 
on a discrete distribution which hasn't yet been tested in the exam. However, it's almost identical to example 14.8 in the notes. So students who'd actually read the notes would have found this easy money. We want a value from x, which in the chapter 14 notation is f of x, but we're going to use a value from y, which is denoted in the notes by h of x. And to do that, we first of all have to calculate the scaling constant, which is the maximum of the ratio of f of x over h of x. Notice we're working with the PDFs, so in this case, we'll be doing a half divided by a third, a third divided by a third, and a sixth divided by a third. And then we'll choose the biggest of those three ratios. Once we've got that, we can then calculate the probability of keeping a value, which is f of x over ch of x. Part 3b asks us how many samples we need to take from y in order to generate one sample from x. Well, recall that long term, we keep 1 over c of the values, and so we'll need c samples for every one value. At worst, if you couldn't have done part a, make up a value of c so you can at least get the mark for part b. Question 5 tests runoff triangles from chapter 11 and should have been the easiest nine marks on the paper. Part 1 asks us to explain why insurance companies make use of runoff triangles. Most students would have naturally said to calculate the reserve, but given that it's two marks, we need to follow that up with a second comment. Why on earth do we need a reserve, given that motor insurance policies are for only one year? Well, that's because claims take a while to develop, hence the development years in the triangle. Part 2, we have to calculate the outstanding claims reserve using the basic chain ladder method. Clearly, the examiner is trying to give us marks. The only excitement is that we're given incremental data rather than cumulative, so we'll have to accumulate the figures first of all before we calculate our development ratios. However, there was a tiny misprint in the question because we're given claims incurred, but nowhere in the question does it tell us what claims we've paid to date. There's two ways of answering this. One you could simply write, assuming the examiner meant claims paid and calculate it as normal, or you could calculate the total claims incurred and then tell the examiner that you're not able to calculate the reserve because you don't know what the claims are paid to date. Either way would have got you the full marks. To six, test decision theory from chapter one and is the fourth time that we've had an exam question on risk functions. The previous three questions were April 2010 question 9, April 2012 question 2, and September 2014 question 3. However, the wording in this question is a little confusing. We can see that the decision we have to make is whether we choose a long contract or a short contract. Now, the payoff, as we can see, depends on whether the company is a success or a failure. So these must be the states of nature. But then it talks about we're observing the investment performance of the company's shares relative to the stock market for a whole year. And it mentions companies outperforming and presumably underperforming, depending on whether the state of nature is a success or a failure. So the outperformance or underperformance must be the results we observe, if you like, in our experiment. And so our four decision functions, you'll recall, are not based on the states of nature, but are based on our experimental results. In this case, outperforming or underperforming. Once you've got this, the rest of the question was fairly easy. We get our four decision functions, and then for each of them, we need to calculate what's called the risk function. To do that, let's assume nature is a success, and then we calculate the expected value for each decision function if nature is a success, and then we repeat that for if nature's a fail. These values form our table of results of the decision functions against the two states of nature. We can then do part three, where we're told the probabilities of the two states of nature, and we're asked to calculate the optimal decision function, and so we can do that using Bayes' criterion. If you couldn't do part two, at least make up some numbers so you can show the examiner you know how to use Bayes' criterion. Question seven is 11 marks of pure bookwork testing ruin theory from chapter 9 of the notes. Part 1 asks us to carefully explain the meaning of the probabilities of ruin. This has been asked in September 2008, April 2009, September 2011, April 2012 and September 2013. And so any student who's bothered to look at past questions should have got these marks easily. However, those previous questions ask us for the definitions, which were the probability the surplus process is less than zero, i.e. we're ruined, for some time, whether time is greater than zero, 
and obviously we would have had to define what the surplus process was. Whereas this question says explain carefully, so you could have done that in words instead. The two picky points is that it's for some time, not for all the values of time, and for the final two probabilities, that time is up to t or up to time 1, not at time t or at time 1. Part 2 asks us to state four factors which affect the size of the probability of ruin by time t. Well, I wonder what they could be. Oh yes, they're listed in the question. Lambda, mu, sigma squared, and theta, and who needs four when you could even take five? Don't say t, because the question says for a given t, so that can't change. Part 3 asks us to explain for each factor what happens to that probability of ruin by time t. Notice the word explain. Simply saying that as u increases, the probability of ultimate ruin decreases is not an explain, that's a state. So you need to say why this is the case. Common mistakes are for the parameter lambda. Students will be tempted to simply say increasing lambda means the claims come in faster. Well, yes, they do, but so do the premiums. And for the mu, students often mention that this means the mean claims are increasing, but don't forget the premiums will be increasing as well, as they're a loading factor times by the mean. Part 4 asks us to explain an advantage and disadvantage of using a discrete probability of ruin. Well, that'll be easy marks. However, don't suggest an advantage is that it reduces the probability of ruin so we need less reserves. That's just not professional. Question 8 tests excess of loss reinsurance from chapter 4 of the notes. And this time it's on the log normal distribution, which we've not had a question on for quite some time, the last being April 2004. Part 1 asks us to prove the truncated moment formula and used to be an extremely common question, but again was last asked in April 2004. Essentially what we're going to do is use integration by substitution. Don't complain and say your integration's weak. CT6 always has integration in it. You need to sort out integration by parts and by substitution. If you don't know how to do that, these are covered in our FAC Foundation Actuarial course, which is available as hard copy, ebook, or online classroom. But how do we know what the substitution is? Well, notice that we started with A and B, and we ended up with these more messy expressions in the answer. And so our substitution is that we set u equal to log of x minus mu minus sigma squared over sigma. Once you do that, it drops out. However, it takes a little bit of time to drop out, but at least they give you four marks. In part two, we're told we've got a log normal distribution with mean and standard deviation. So don't get caught out. Your first step will be to work out the parameters mu and sigma squared, because you're going to need that for the formula from part one. And we've got excess of loss reinsurance with a retention of 500. And we're asked to calculate the average expected claim size payable by the insurance company. Well, for claims less than the retention limit, we'll pay the full claim amount. And for claims greater than our retention limit, we'll just pay the retention of 500. The first integral we can solve by using the result from part one, or the formula on page 18 of the tables, with k equal to one. For our second integral, we could take the 500 outside, but we can't use our formula from part one because that's for x times f of x. You could use the page 18 formula with k equal to zero, or you could just observe that this is the probability that x is more than 500 and calculate this using your standard CT3 knowledge. In the final part of the question, claims are increased by 10%, and we have to explain whether the average expected claim will also increase by 10%. Notice it says explain, so we're going to have to give a reason why. Essentially, the claims that we do pay are increased, but the claims that are passed on to the reinsurer are not increased, and so it won't quite increase by the full 10%. Question 9, test time series from chapter 12 of the notes, and is the most gorgeous question we've had for ages. This would have been an easy 12 marks. In part 1, we have to determine whether the process is stationary, so to do that, we need to rearrange it in terms of the backward shift operator and then obtain our characteristic equation, set it equal to zero and solve it. Both routes will be greater than one and so it's stationary. Some students got a little confused about what to do with the one. Technically, it goes on the left hand side. However, you'll have to do part two to find out what the mean is and then put it there. We're also asked to identify what kind of time series it is 
Well, we can say that we've got an autoregressive term from two ago, so the p is two, but we've got no past white noise terms, so the q is zero. For part two, we have to calculate the mean of the time series. No worries, let's just find the mean of both sides. Recall that the mean of a white noise process is zero, and so we have the following expression. But in part one, we observe that it's stationary. And if it's stationary, that means the mean is unchanged over time. So they'll all equal a common value, which we'll call mu. It's no bother to calculate what that is. For part three, we have to calculate the ACF and the PACF for the first four values. This is very standard stuff. First of all, you obtain your Yule Walker equations for the autocovariance, and then we need to get them in terms of gamma zero. Taking our second equation and rearranging that gives us gamma one is 0.6 over 0.84 gamma zero, or if you prefer, 5 sevenths gamma zero, and substituting this in our third equation will give us gamma two is equal to 103 over 175 gamma zero. Similarly, we could substitute these, the fourth and fifth equations, to get the gamma three and gamma four. Dividing both sides of those two equations by gamma zero gives us row one is five sevenths and row two is 103 over 175. Substituting those, it'll be no bother to get the final two values that we require. For the PACF, you'll recall that the formulae are given on page 40 of the tables. Uh, the examiners use size when they should have used phi's, but hopefully you could cope with that. And phi one is equal to row one, which is five sevenths. Phi two is equal to row two minus row one squared over one minus row one squared, which will work out to be 0.16. And phi three and phi four are given in terms of determinants of three by three and four by four matrices. There's no way we want to do that. But if you remember, in part one, we said it was an AR2, and so the PACF will cut off after lag two. And so the values will be zero. Our final question on the paper tests the exponential family from chapter 10 of the notes. Part one gives us yet more marks for regurgitating a proof this time on the mean and variance of the exponential family. This proof has only been tested once before, which is April 2011, question eight. These are proved in the notes, but will require students to remember the two results that were given, which might have been a little bit harder. Alternatively, you could start with the fact that the integral over the full range is equal to one, and then differentiate both sides with respect to theta, and that will give you the mean result, and then differentiate it a second time with respect to theta, and rearranging will give you the variance result. Or if you're feeling a bit clever, and can remember the hint given in April 2011 question eight, you could obtain the MGF of the exponential family. However, to get any further, you'll have to use a little clever trick, which is rewriting the PDF in terms of another exponential family, in which case that integral goes to one. Logging the MGF gives you the CGF, then differentiate it once and sticking t equals zero gives us the mean, and differentiating it twice and sticking t is zero gives you the variance. For part two, we're asked to derive an expression for the third central moment of an exponential family, i.e. the skewness. Now this isn't given in the notes, and so we can't quote results from there. If you're using the first method, you would simply differentiate it a third time. If you're using the CGF method, differentiating it a third time and sticking in t is zero will give you the skewness. But I suspect most students struggle to make any headway there. Part three of the question asks us to show that the gamma distribution is a member of the exponential family and is very common, having been asked in April 2013, September 2010 and April 2007. Given that there are only five functions that can be written in the form of an exponential family, why students will have practiced them all? and so this would have been an easy four marks. The last part of the question requires us to use the formulae from parts one and two, or if you couldn't derive them, from page 27 of the notes. At worst exam technique, if you couldn't obtain an expression for the skewness, make one up so at least you can get some follow through marks for part four. If you wish to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.acted.co.uk forward slash forums. On screen now are links to videos from our stats refresher course for those who got a CT3 exemption and obviously need a little bit more help and a sample unit from our CT6 online classroom if you'd like tuition but are unable to attend one of our face-to-face -face courses. Thanks for watching.